In late 1778, the British and American forces in the Middle Atlantic region had reached a stalemate. With the French entry into the war, British forces had been diverted to protect the Empire's Caribbean holdings. The troops who were left under General Sir Henry Clinton were hunkering down to spend a dull winter in New York, based in Manhattan and Staten Island. To keep the British bottled up, George Washington had to keep his army in the field for the winter. It was important to deny the Royalists access to food and supplies in the countryside. In addition, Washington had to be prepared to counter any unexpected British troop movements to the north or south. That meant keeping his army together, something that was not standard practice in the 1700s. Coming on the heels of the previous winter's miserable experience at Valley Forge, the prospect of spending another winter in the field could hardly have been very attractive to Washington and his men. Yet he decided to place the core of his army at the small town of Middlebrook, New Jersey, near today's Somerville. Perched at the base of the Wachung Mountains, Washington could protect southern New Jersey while using the mountains to screen his movements to the north should that become necessary. The infantry started to pour into Middlebrook in early December of 1778. The Continental Artillery was under the command of Brigadier General Henry Knox, and they were diverted to a safe position to the rear of American lines at the small crossroads village of Pluckaman. The little town of Pluckaman was at the hub of a network of roads rated by British spies as excellent. As seen on this map, surveyed by British Lieutenant John Hill, these roads could handle the heavy weight of cannon and their accompanying ammunition. Even today, the village is at the junction of Interstates 287 and 78, and State Routes 202 and 206. In part because of this advantage, Washington also decided to locate the field arm of the military storage department at Pluckaman that winter. In fact, the winter cantonment at Pluckaman was much more ambitious than most people recognized then or now. Joining the 22 companies of artillery were two companies of craftsmen, artificers such as carpenters, joiners, blacksmiths, and wheelwrights, as well as a company of continental armorers who were gunsmiths and weapon specialists. This allowed them to build a much more substantial set of buildings than the simple log cabins that made up other winter camps. This drawing, one of only three contemporary drawings of American Revolutionary War winter cantonments known to exist, was drawn by Captain John Lilly, who was in the 3rd Continental Artillery and later became Commandant at West Point. What it shows is remarkable, and a combination of historical research and archaeology has revealed the nature and the function of the various buildings. At the center of the camp, perhaps most easily recognizable, is an academy erected by Knox for training his officers. Described in the records as 30 by 50 feet, with a plastered interior and glass windows, this was the new nation's first military academy. Adjacent to the academy was the so-called long room, used as a headquarters office. On the other side of the academy was the new line of barracks, built to house seven companies of Lamb's Regiment of Artillery. It was called new because the first barracks was a much longer building designed to accommodate 15 companies of artillerists who began to arrive on December 7, 1778. The officers initially stayed in houses in town and around the countryside, but eventually they moved into barracks constructed specifically for their use. Two lieutenant colonels who were present throughout the winter were placed in roomier quarters uphill, in keeping with the pyramidal hierarchy of the armory. Downhill was a guardhouse to keep everyone in place, and the unfinished building to the right along the south edge of the camp was probably a set of warehouses for gun carriages, wagons, and the materials of the military storage department. In the right-hand side of the long building to the southeast were workshops such as a forge and a gunsmith shop, and the armors and artificers were quartered in the left-hand side of that building. The scatter of cabins to the far left, at the north end of the site, were probably used by camp followers, sutlers, and for a variety of other purposes. The Pluckaman cantonment was a remarkable accomplishment, one not paralleled elsewhere during the war. Artillerists were trained there, officers studied in the academy, craftsmen made and repaired equipment, and the military stores department gathered materiel and resupplied the larger American army for the coming campaign. But remarkably, in the spring and summer of 1779, the site was gradually abandoned. It continued as a general hospital during the next winter of 1779-1780, but for a variety of reasons, Washington decided to move his primary camp farther north to Morristown. Then the site, once a beehive of military activity, reverted to field and forest, eventually forgotten by all but a handful of locals. In the 1980s, spurred by the threat of logging and residential development on the site, 
A team of archaeologists from the nonprofit Pluckerman Archaeological Project spent a decade uncovering the remains of the cantonment. After clearing brush and laying out a carefully placed grid system, their surveys mapped piles of stone where John Lilly had shown chimneys, and lines of rock marked old walls. Careful plotting of these features, and of artifacts scattered across the surface, showed the archaeologists what had taken place in various parts of the camp. In the area of the officers' quarters, for example, Chinese porcelain tea service, better cuts of meat, oysters, and fancier accoutrements revealed a more privileged and well-supplied lifestyle. The forge area and the armorer shop provided glimpses of weaponry of the period and successful efforts at repair, manufacture, and resupply. A tinsmith shop became apparent through fragments of cartridge boxes, canteens, tin cups, and much other material. And the rooms in which the craftsmen themselves lived were uncovered through excavations that revealed tools, civilian clothing, and some of the most recent pottery from England. This digging also uncovered the walls of their barracks, a fireplace and a hearth covered with charred wood and ashes still in place, and nails and pane glass that reveal a much more sophisticated construction than the log cabins of Valley Forge. Although the excavations at Pluckerman concluded in 1989, work on the collection of more than a million artifacts continues. Under the auspices of the Friends of the Jacobus Vanderveer House, a consortium of researchers from Washington College, Monmouth University, and Hunter Research are analyzing materials, compiling databases, and shedding new light on one of the country's most important archaeological sites. And as the work progresses, it's now possible to think about reconstructing the artillery cantonment, if not in wooden stone, then at least in the computer. The Washington College GIS Laboratory is combining historical and archaeological information to create a three-dimensional model showing what the site might have looked like in 1779. There are many uncertainties given the passage of more than two centuries, but we can nevertheless put some flesh on the bones of history and better visualize this remarkable place. What Knox and his men built at Pluckerman was remarkable, and it mirrored what Knox had recommended to Congress as early as 1776 in his hints for the improvement of the artillery of the United States. He advocated establishing military supply and manufacturing depots around the country, along with military academies where officers could learn their craft. Although Congress paid no attention at the time, his was a prescient vision, and it would later be put into practice at West Point. But during the winter of 1778-1779, the training and resupply of the Continental Army that took place at Pluckerman helped to fashion an army that could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the most powerful force in the world, and which would eventually defeat the British at Yorktown. Pluckerman is a legacy and a site that has been largely overlooked in standard histories. It's also quite different than the vision we have of the troops at Valley Forge, eating shoes and leaving bloody, bloody footprints in the snow. But the Pluckerman Cantonment is an equally important episode, and it goes a long way toward explaining the ultimate success of the new nation's army.